Hi class, so this week we're covering part two, understanding racism, sexism, heterosexism, and class privilege. So what do you guys think? Do you think racism still exists or you think racism is a thing of the past? So racism is not hard to see if we're paying attention. Stereotypical images of people of color in the media, housing discrimination, documented racial bias and lending practices among well-known banks, and even with the most recent events. So there were two recent events just this month in August where unarmed black men were shot by police officers. So one happened in Louisiana where Trayford Pellerin was shot 10 times while walking away. So he died a short time later. And a few days later in Wisconsin, another event where Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back while his children looked on. He's most likely gonna be paralyzed for the rest of his life. In both of these cases, these men posed no direct threat to the officers. Clearly, the police had alternative options to managing the situation other than excessive force. So on August 26th, NASW released a statement demanding an end to excessive use of force by law enforcement. NASW states that the deaths of black men at the hands of police must stop. NASW is calling on Congress to immediately pass legislation that implements national use of force standards by police and for Congress to mandate that all law enforcement agencies should follow these standards. So the impact of racism begins early, even in our preschool years. We are constantly exposed to misinformation about people who are different than ourselves. Many of us grew up in neighborhoods where we had limited opportunities to interact with people different from our own families. How many of you grew up in those neighborhoods where most of the people were from the same racial group as your own? How many of you still live in neighborhoods where most people are from the same racial group as your own? There is still a great deal of segregation in our communities. As a result, most of the early information we receive about other people who are either racially different, religiously, or socioeconomically different from ourselves does not come as a result of firsthand experience. And so whenever we receive secondhand information, this information can be distorted, it can be shaped by cultural stereotypes, or it can be incomplete. So an example, a perfect example from the book was the research project investigating preschoolers. So the, the research project was looking at preschoolers' conceptions of Native Americans, and when the children were asked to draw a picture of a Native American, they didn't know what a Native American was, but once they were asked to draw a picture of an Indian, then they all were able to draw a picture. And one thing they had in common was that they all drew feathers. And most of them also include some type of a weapon, which was either a knife or a tomahawk, depicting the Indians as violent or aggressive. So Though this group of children, almost all of whom were white, did not live near a large native population and probably had little, if any, personal interaction with American Indians, they all internalized an image of what Indians were like. So how would they know that? Cartoon images, in particular Disney movie Peter Pan, were cited as the number one source of information. So at the age of three, these children already had a set of stereotypes in place. Though we wouldn't say that three-year-olds are prejudiced, the stereotypes to which they had been exposed become the foundation for the adult prejudice so many of us have. Omitted information can also have similar effects. For example, a young woman preparing to become a high school English teacher expressed her concern that she had never learned of any black authors in any of her English classes. How was she supposed to teach about them to her future students if she herself hadn't learned about them. A white male student in the class responded with frustration that it wasn't his fault that blacks don't write books. So because he had never been exposed to black authors, he had drawn his own conclusions that there were no black authors. So whether it's distorted information, whether it's cultural stereotypes, whether it's incomplete information, secondhand information, or not receiving those, that information can also have similar effects in terms of the impact of racism and the prejudice that we may develop later on in life. I remember when I was getting my undergraduate degree, I went to school for 
almost four years before I got my first black professor. So I think I was either in my last or second to last semester when I finally had an African-American professor. And throughout the whole time, I had already had an assumption or made an assumption that, well, there's this is probably just the way it is. All the professors are white. The same thing through my master's degree. During all full two years, I only had one black professor. It's easy to just form those opinions or those assumptions about how something is if that's all you've experienced and if nobody tells you anything different. Stereotypes, omissions, and distortions all contribute to the development of prejudice. So prejudice is a preconceived judgment or opinion usually based on limited information. We all have prejudices, not because we want to have them, but simply because we constantly are exposed to misinformation about others. Prejudice is one of the inescapable consequences of living in a racist society. Cultural racism is the cultural images and messages that affirm the assumed superiority of whites and the assumed inferiority of people of color. So if we live in an environment in which we are constantly bombarded with stereotypical images in the media, or frequently exposed to the ethnic jokes of friends and family members, or were rarely informed of the accomplishments of oppressed groups, then we will develop the negative categorizations of those groups that form the basis of prejudice. Stereotypes is a widely held but simplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing believed in common by others. So what are some common stereotypes that you've heard? Hi there. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. I, uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean. But I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. Yeah. Ham Shasina. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place near my apartment. So I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm just American. Really? You're Native American? No, uh, just regular American. Oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well. Hello, Gamda! What's all this then? Top of the morning to you. Let's get a small tea, small tea! Double, double, toil and trouble! Mind the gap! Beware, Jack the Ripper! Bloody hell! Pip, pip! Cheerio! I think your people's fish and chips are amazing. You're weird. Really? I'm weird? Must be a Korean thing. Fish and chips, pheasants, pot of cream, Bangers and mash, Guinness, Plowman's lunch, a spot of tea, a pint of ale. <laughs> so again, did you guys notice the stereotypes in this video? He saw an Asian and he just assumed that he just made assumptions based on what she looked like, where she was from. So with internalized oppression, it's when the member of the stereotype group internalizes the stereotypical categories about his or her own group to some degree. So when the person who stereotyped start believing those stereotypes about themselves. So of course, people of any racial group can hold hateful attitudes and behave in racially discriminatory ways. We can all come up with examples of horrible hate crimes that have been perpetrated by people of color as well as whites. 
Hateful behavior is hateful behavior no matter who does it. So can people of color be racist? The answer depends on how you define racism. So if one defines racism as racial prejudice, then the answer is yes. People of color can and do have racial prejudices. However, if one defines racism as a system of advantage based on race, then the answer is no. People of color are not racist because they do not systematically benefit from racism. And just as important, there is no systemic cultural and institutional support for the racial bigotry of people of color. The same way, though women can and do have gender-based prejudices, only men systematically benefit from sexism. So when it comes to racism, you can either experience active racism or passive racism. So with active racism, there's blatant intentional acts of racial bigotry and discrimination. So it's intentional acts. It's you can clearly see that someone's being racist with passive racism. This is more subtle. So with passive racism, you're more of a bystander. So you you're not actively being racist, but you're not speaking up against it either. So for example, not speaking out against discriminatory hiring practices, laughing when racist jokes are made, we are all kind of guilty of that one. And then finally, avoiding dealing with racial related situations. So sometimes people just kind of stay away from the topic. They don't get involved. Well, all of these are examples of passive racism. So the most common understanding of racism emphasizes discrete acts of bigotry by malicious individuals. Under this model, racism is easy to spot and is clearly reprehensible. Structural racism emphasizes structures rather than individuals. It's also known as institutional racism. So when a white terrorist bombs a black church and kills five black children, this can be considered as individual racism. But when 500 black babies die every year because of the lack of proper food, shelter, and medical facilities, and thousands more are destroyed physically, emotionally, and intellectually because of conditions of poverty and discrimination in the black community, this is institutional racism. Implicit bias stressed that almost all of us draw on racial ideas at the implicit level. Here's a video explaining these concepts a little bit more. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor neighborhood. He has a friend named Kevin who lives in a wealthy neighborhood. All of Jamal's neighbors are African American and all of Kevin's neighbors are white. Because Jamal's school district is mostly funded by property taxes, his school is not very well funded. His classrooms are overcrowded, his teachers are underpaid, and he doesn't have access to high quality tutors or extracurricular activities. Kevin's school district is also funded by property taxes, so his school is very well funded. His classrooms are never crowded, his teachers are very well paid, and he has access to high quality tutors and lots of extracurricular activities. Kevin and Jamal live only a few streets away from each other. So how come they're growing up in such different worlds with such different opportunities for success? The answer has to do with America's history of systemic racism. To understand it better, let's look at what life was like for Kevin and Jamal's grandparents. Decades after the Civil War, many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable or undesirable for investment. This practice was called redlining and it usually blocked off entire black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Banks and insurance companies used these maps for decades to deny black people loans and other services based purely on race. Historically speaking, owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But when Jamal's grandparents wanted to buy a house, the banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home, and because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Kevin's grandparents, on the other hand, got a low interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. Even as late as the 1980s, an investigation into the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, black families have $5.04.
A 2017 study confirms that redlining is still affecting home values in major cities like Chicago today. This explains how Kevin and Jamal inherited vastly different circumstances. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. A big part of systemic racism is implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university. The same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's, even though they graduated from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white sounding names get twice as many callbacks as identical resumes with black sounding names. Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment, even among college graduates today. You can see evidence of systemic racism in every area of life. The disparities in family wealth, incarceration rates, political representation, and education are all examples of systemic racism. Unfortunately, the biggest challenge with systemic racism is that there's no single person or entity responsible for it, which makes it very hard to solve. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is work towards becoming more aware of your own implicit biases. What are some prejudices that you might hold that you're not aware of? Second, let's acknowledge that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws are still affecting access to opportunity today. As a result, we should support systemic changes that create more equal opportunities for everyone. Increasing public school funding and making it independent from property taxes would be a great start so that poor and wealthy districts can receive equal access to resources. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Luckily, we're all part of the system, which means that we all have a role to play in making it better. Peace. All right, future social workers. So as the video say, we all have a role to play in making things better. So a lot of times when it comes to racism, we hear people say, well, I don't see color. Well, there is this thing called colorblind racism. So there's four different kinds. The first one is abstract liberalism. So with abstract liberalism, whites use these principles in an abstract way to allow them to support the racial status quo in an apparently reasonable fashion. An example of this is when opposing affirmative action programs because they give special treatment to certain groups. This ignores the underrepresentation of those groups. Naturalization is when whites normalize actions or events that could otherwise be considered racially motivated or racist. An example of this is when you ask a white person, how comes they don't have any black friends? And they may give you an answer like, well, it's not that I don't have black friends or it's not that I don't hang out with black friends. Everyone just wants to spend time with people who are like them. So it's not that I don't have black friends because they're black. It's just that I like to hang out with people who are like me. Another example is with upper management. So when it comes with upper level management, most people in those positions are white. And one rationale for this would be that people in upper management is white because that's just the way it is. So, so normalizing the fact that almost everyone in upper management is white, they're normalizing it as that's just the way it is rather than it being racially motivated. Biologization of culture. Modern racial ideology no longer relies on the claim that blacks are biologically inferior. Instead, it has biologized their presumed cultural practices and used that as a rationale for explaining racial inequality. An example is that an example of this is that minorities are lazy and that's why they don't achieve anything or that blacks are poor because they lack the drive to succeed so they are rationalizing their explanation for racial inequality here the last one is minimization of racism so although whites and blacks believe that discrimination is still a problem in the u.s they disagree on the prominence so for example 
Whites believe that it has all but disappeared, but blacks believe that it is as American as apple pie. So, so even with the recent events like with George Floyd or Jacob Blake and Trayford Pellerin, it seems hard to imagine that anyone would still be unaware of the reality of racism in our society. However, it's still minimized. One theme is the importance of racial categorizing in anti-Asian violence. So the killing of Vincent Chin is an example of how anti-Asian violence is racialized. So based on his physical appearance, the Chinese American was taken to a Japanese national by his killers who had made him the focus of their anger and frustration towards Japanese competition in the automobile industry. A perpetrator who makes the race-based generalization that all Asians look alike puts every Asian American at risk, even if the specific conflicts are targeted against a smaller subset of people. Another theme displayed by anti-Asian violence is the centrality of nativism, which is the intense opposition to an internal minority on the ground of its foreign connections. So Asian Americans are equated with foreigners, or they are at least presumed to be foreign born. Race and nativism thus intersect to produce a distinctive form of subordination of Asian Americans. A related theme made evident by anti-Asian violence revolves around the intermediate position that Asian Americans appear to occupy on a social and economic ladder that places whites on top and blacks at the bottom. Black on Asian hate crimes often contain strong elements of cultural conflict and nativism. Blacks like whites treat Asians as foreigners, but black on Asian crimes also have strains traceable to resentment over the economic achievements of Asian Americans. Model minority stereotype of Asian Americans becomes a two-edged sword breeding not only incomplete and inaccurate images of Asian American success, but also resentment and hostility on the part of other racial groups. Racial differentiation often places Asian Americans in a middle position within the racial hierarchy of the US, neither black nor white, and somewhere between black and white. Boy, I'm sure glad we left the pool party tray. Bath homework is way more fun. <sighs> Computer, that's the first thing you've ever said that doesn't add up. <laughs> You're so studious, computer. Trey, you could learn a thing or two from his people. They're very wise. Whoa, time out. Here we go again. TV and movies are rampant with Asian stereotypes, especially the idea that Asian people are some kind of model minority. Smart, successful, polite, obedient, and of course, inherently good at math. Gee, what's the big deal? Those are all compliments. Well, these compliments actually originated in a government propaganda campaign. And not too long ago, white Americans actually thought the exact opposite. Time in. In the mid-1800s, Americans were so hostile to Chinese people, the country passed laws banning Chinese immigration and denying their freedoms. They were stereotyped as a lazy, opium-addicted, menacing whore dubbed the Yellow Peril. And your old Uncle Sammy didn't stop there. Uncle Sammy! Yeah, Uncle Sammy hasn't been such a cool uncle. Because of anti-Asian racism during World War II, the United States interned Japanese Americans in concentration camps. Hey, it's our Japanese friend Kenji from up the street. Oh, that's not your friend. That's a spy who wants to kill Americans. <laughs> uncle Sammy, why didn't you do that to German Americans in World War II? Yeah, I wonder. Because, because they're, they're white. white. But all that changed when the U.S. needed to suck up to its Asian allies during the Cold War. See, as the Soviet Union rose to power, the U.S. worried that Soviet propaganda was making communism sound dynamite. America is so racist, am I right? It's like, hey, USA, cut it out. Woof. Guess I better have mercy on these Asians. So America embarked on a propaganda campaign to tout Asian American success stories. The State Department highlighted Asian American artists, politicians, and even sent an all Chinese American basketball team on tour overseas. Forget all that nastiness earlier. America loves our Asian sports heroes. 
And in 1965, Congress approved a landmark immigration law that ditched racist restrictions. But it gave preference to immigrants who had training, talent, or skill sets that would benefit the U.S. economy. Sammy and the Rippers are changing their tune. Borders now open for smart, successful Asian immigrants. Wow, now that I've led all these educated, successful Asians into America, I've got to say, Asian Americans sure are successful and educated. So America went from a country that despised Asians to one that held them up as a shining example of assimilation. And this self-fulfilling prophecy resulted in the model minority myth. And the most sinister part of this myth is it was used to put other minorities down and it's still holding people back today. Oh, it's our very special guest star, professor of history at Indiana University, Ellen Wu. Why did I need to use the ladder, Adam? Aren't we on the ground floor? It's a sitcom thing. In the 1960s, government officials looked at socioeconomic data from African-American communities and contrasted it to the so-called family values and stability of Asian Americans. Now, this fueled racist claims that black people had no one to blame but themselves if they experienced poverty and other social disadvantages. Conservatives went on to use these claims to justify making cuts to many essential social programs for African Americans and other disadvantaged minority groups. They were even used to argue against civil rights. Come on, you don't see computer complaining about fair and equal protection. Asians earned their place in this country. Why can't you? What? No, Uncle Sammy, you helped Asian people. Why can't you see that? And the model minority myth hurts Asian people too. If an Asian American student is struggling in school, many teachers assume that they don't really need extra help. And it's not true that all Asians are crazy rich and successful. <laughs> The poverty rate for Asian Americans is actually higher than the national average. And frankly, it's kind of ridiculous that we lump people from so many different backgrounds together as Asian. Yeah, Asian people are not a monolith. Trey, you and your multi-ethnic adopted parents keep referring to me as your smart Asian neighbor. Specifically, I am Korean American. And sure, I'm smart, but I also love Ultimate Frisbee. Why doesn't anybody talk about that? You know what this is messed up? Computer is a person who contains multitudes and probably has a real name. You know what, Uncle Sammy? This is all your fault. Get out of my room. Whoa, watch the hair. Okay, so we're gonna discuss ableism, sexism, and heterosexism using a case from the book. So Sharon Kowalski was in a head-on collision with a drunk driver. She suffered a severe brainstem injury, she became paralyzed, and she lost the ability to speak. Sharon was in a committed partnership with Karen Thompson. Serious conflicts soon developed between Karen and Sharon's parents, which led to a series of lawsuits. Karen fought to secure adequate rehabilitation for Sharon, as well as access to family and friends of her choice. Under the Minnesota guardianship laws, Sharon's father placed her in a nursing home without adequate rehabilitation services and prohibited Karen and others from visiting her. So while the story shows a violation of their human rights, it is more than a story of two individuals. The injustices that they suffered were modes of oppression that operate at a social structural level that affect many people. So thanks to ableism, Sharon was often stereotyped as helpless. Her inability to speak was construed as incompetence and her particular kinds of communication were not recognized. Also, ableism can lead to keeping disabled persons hidden, literally out of sight. The second mode of oppression infusing this case was heterosexism. Clearly apparent is a failure to recognize gay lesbian relationships. So when Karen first got to the hospital, she was not allowed access to Sharon or any information because she was not family. Sexism is sufficiently interfused with heterosexism that they are hard to separate. It often enforces a social role in women in which they are subordinated to men. Sexism was apparent in awarding guardianship to the father. So this case makes clear that the modes of oppression work simultaneously. There is no hierarchy of oppression, so disability was not more important than sexuality in curtailing Sharon's freedoms. 
They work together in her life, as in the legal and medical systems. So gender roles serve both men and women who seek power from them. So men only suffer in part from gender roles, whereas women suffer completely. Gender roles are maintained through weapons of sexism, including economics, violence, and homophobia. To be a lesbian is to be perceived as someone who has stepped out of line, who has moved out of sexual economic dependence on a male. A lesbian is perceived as someone who can live without a man and who is therefore against men. A lesbian is perceived as a threat to the nuclear family, to male dominance and control, and to the very heart of sexism. Gay men are also perceived as a threat to male dominance and control, and the homophobia expressed against them has the same roots in sexism as does homophobia against lesbians. Visible gay men are the objects of extreme hatred and fear by heterosexual men because their breaking ranks with male heterosexual solidarity is seen as damaging rent in the very fabric of sexism. They are seen as betrayers and traitors who must be punished and eliminated. Sexism also affects males. When we see the fierce homophobia expressed toward gay men, we can begin to understand the ways sexism also affects males through imposing rigid, dehumanizing gender roles on them. Being vulnerable to a homophobic world can lead to losses. It can lead to the fear of job loss, to the fear of lack of family approval, acceptance, and love, the fear that they would not be able to foster or adopt any children. There is also the irrational fear that children in contact with lesbians or gays will become homosexuals or that they will be sexually abused. There's also the fear of heterosexual privilege and protection. There's also the fear that there is no way to turn for safety from physical and verbal attacks. There's the fear that it'll be difficult to maintain a strong sense of well-being and self-esteem. For many in the gay and lesbian communities, there is a loss of public acceptance, a loss of allies, a loss of place and belonging. And then finally, the fear that they will no longer be respected, listened to, honored, or believed. And this brings us to the end of the first part of part two. Next week, we'll finish up the remainder of part two.